Hi guys, and welcome to the 2012 anniversary edition of Skyrim Mod Sanctuary, part three. In part one and two of this series, we were covering a pre-creation kit modding community, basically. Uh, we were talking about the mods that came out in the early days and even a few months later, prior to the creation kit. And we'd already seen a lot of incredible mods, uh, but obviously we were expecting things to change with the creation kit. But one of the things that we did not mention um, was the Steam Workshop, which came out at the same time as the Creation Kit. Now, there was quite a lot of trepidation and anticipation for the Steam Workshop, and there was a lot of discussion. Would it destroy the um, modding community? Would it tear apart things like Nexus? Would it replace them? Because, of course, the aim here was that modding would be as easy as official DLC. You would simply click a button and everything would work perfectly for you without any worries whatsoever. Now, all things considered, this was probably a little bit uh, of an extreme view. Um, it was unlikely that this tool was ever going to threaten um, the modern communities such as Nexus, etc. And, I mean, it really did seem more geared towards people who were very new to the, to the idea of modding. And it certainly wasn't going to make modding super simple and just as easy as official DLC. However, there were signs that the people who implemented the workshop did not consult with the modding community in any great depth. Or if they did, they decided to ignore them. And I'm talking specifically a number of um, key issues that came up when I initially looked at it. The first and most obvious, the complete lack of a load order tool. Now, for those of you who, you know, have not been paying attention, load order is very important in Skyrim and all Bethesda games. So, luckily, they did actually implement a whole new system, um, and this system is, is actually a, a, fairly, a fairly big improvement over the old way, to be honest, and therefore Nexus Mod Manager and other Mod Manager tools had to adapt to the new system as well. But there were other things. Um, the inclusion of auto-update. Now, this is something that um, I have always warned against. People have asked for it on other mod managers, um, like with Nexus Mod Manager, and I am passionately against it. But with the workshop, it's not just included. It's forced upon you. You, you have no choice. Um, you will have your mods auto-updated, which is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, I... I'm not going to cover the great details as to why that's terrible in this video, um, but uh, I may actually do another video on it if you guys are interested. And there are a few other things, um, less important, but still this may mean that they really did aim the workshop at people very new to modding with the expectation that once they got a taste for it, they would then go out and join one of the other communities and mod their game further. And in fact, I think that is more or less what has happened. So in the end, a sort of fairly good status quo has been found. So, on to part 18 of Skyrim Mod Sanctuary. Now, Skyrim Mod Sanctuary part 18 was um, a video that covered two mods. The first mod was Warzone's mod, and this was basically a mod that added lots of battles and wars to Skyrim. Um, the basic premise behind this is there's a civil war going on, why don't you keep running into little battles going on? I mean, nobody seems to be fighting anybody else. And Warzone's did this, he added uh, groups of Stormcloaks, groups of Imperials, all battling each other. Sometimes it would be groups of bandits or even roving groups of mages fighting each other. So it made um, Skyrim a lot busier and a lot more dangerous. And the second mod was Open City Skyrim. Now this was an incredible feat. Um, you know, as you all know, in Skyrim, all the cities are self-contained little zones. You click on the gate and you go into the city. But with the Open Cities mod, the cities were actually part of the world. So you would open the gate to the city and you could see the outside world and inside the city without ever zoning, without having to load. And this gave you a great feeling of always being connected to the world, always being connected to Skyrim, even when in a city. At the time of the video, there were only, I believe, three cities covered, but now, 
um, he's actually covered all the city, so it's pretty much complete now. However, it did come with a few problems. Um, the first problem was at the time, there was a nav mesh bug that caused NPCs to get lost outside the city. Uh, that has since been fixed, and it wasn't actually a problem with the mod, but a problem with the game, and Bethesda fixed that, so that was done. But the other thing is, it basically prevented you from using any mods that changed cities. So if you had a better white run, etc., anything like that, it wouldn't work because the city had now been transported from its own little area into the Skyrim land and it was a different place. So you, you basically just did not get any of the changes from the other mod. And so this mod has just gone from strength to strength, really, becoming, um, if you've got the machine to run it, by the way, I mean, here's one thing you should know about this mod. It will require a decent machine. There is a reason they separated the cities from Skyrim, and that is performance. Um, you will find it hits your performance quite a lot. But I'm afraid that is not the end of the story where this mod is concerned. Um, in fact, ironically, the name of Part 18 was Open War. That's what I called it in, in you know, celebration of the Open Cities mod and the War Zones. So I called it Open War. However, it turned out to be a bit of a prophetic name. I promised you guys a little bit of controversy in the uh, last video, and this is it. You see, one of the things that was added to a later version of Open Cities were Oblivion Gates from the fourth Elder Scrolls games. And he placed these Oblivion Gates in cities, so it changed the look of the city a little bit. And a lot of people resented that. Um, and there were a lot of complaints, a lot of accusations of feature creep, etc. Now, I personally don't like the inclusion of these Oblivion Gates. Um, I, I'm just not that keen on it. However, I am a firm believer that it is a mod author's prerogative to, you know, do what he likes with the mod. Um, however, not everybody agrees with that. And a number of people decided to basically put a new theory they had to the test, and that theory was they could take any mod they wanted and change it, use it, take resources from it, and repost it, and they are completely allowed to do so because that's how they interpreted the um, EULA. Um, and this is exactly what happened. Up on the Steam Workshop, um, there, were, there was a Open Cities Without Oblivion Gates uploaded, and the uploader of that was completely unashamed in that he had, you know, he was totally open about it and said, yes, I took his mod completely, removed the gates and posted it myself, and anyone who doesn't like it can go and, you know, insert expletive here. And over on the Steam uh, workshop, there was a massive war of words where a lot of people fairly new to the community, I, I believe, were essentially arguing that there was nothing wrong with this and that it was perfectly okay to essentially steal mod author's work and do what you like with it. They, of course, did not call it stealing. Um, however, as you can imagine, the, the vast majority of the existing modding community did. And so this was a huge kind of test case for what was going to happen with the workshop and our mods. And a lot of us were watching very, very closely to see what was going to happen. Um, I think the essential argument was um, you sign an agreement saying Bethesda has the rights to anything you make, therefore that means everyone has the rights to everything you make. Uh, this did not stand up. Uh, under scrutiny and this mod was in fact removed but if you want to actually play this mod without the oblivion gates there is actually a patch for it um, the mod author of the original mod even links to it on his page um, and this is the only official patch that he supports and allows um, so if you don't want to play with the gates just use this patch and they're gone dead easy and so now that we've covered all the drama in part 18, let's move right along to part 19. Now, part 19 had a few great mods. Um, it, basically, there were three. The first mod was Cloaks of Skyrim. 
Um, this was a mod that had the first mod, I believe, to add cloaks to Skyrim and is still in use now. It is, um, it's obviously come a long way, adds quite a few new cloaks. The cloaks now don't have to just be crafted. You will find them on NPCs and guards, etc. So this mod is still very, very popular and very relevant today. There was also a mod called RCRM, which stands for Realistic Colours and Real Nights. And this is another lighting stroke weather map, and it comes with a host of features, really. I mean, it's a massive list of features, and it looks great. Um, it makes the nights, again, scary and intimidating, as I like, and a lot of great weather effects, a lot of great sunrises. The performance hit was slightly higher than for mods like... Uh, realistic lighting, but still well worth checking out. I mean, as to which you'd prefer, it always comes down to uh, personal taste, uh, but I did like this mod. This was a really good mod to use. And it is still being developed, it is still being pushed forward. Um, the other mod was a thinner compass. Now this was a mod that made your compass a little thinner, um, and I liked this one. And the mod author actually created a version of it that was compatible with Immersive Hood, my own mod. Um, however, that's no longer needed. Um, my mod is now compatible with all heads-up display mods, theoretically. Um, so this is still a mod I like to use. I still like to use this, but I don't. Because, unfortunately, since the Dawnguard DLC, I have uh, I've wanted to use the horse combat and the heads-up display on horse. This mod and at the moment quite a few other heads-up display mods unfortunately disable the heads-up display on horse so there's still an issue with it. Still if you're not into mounted combat this is still a useful mod if you want a, a lot thinner and more subtle compass. Um, so there you go. Now in part 20 um, I carried on my discussion of RCRN because this is the sort of mod that requires several weeks to really evaluate um, and as I said still gave it a glowing report in this particular video. But I also introduced a mod called the Imaginator, visual control device for Skyrim. Now people who played Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas may well have used the Imaginator on those games and it is a mod by MGE uh, which stands for My Good Eye. And uh, I actually helped out on this mod a little bit. So, you know, again, <laughs> full disclosure, slightly biased. But this is a mod that allows you to change the visuals, the lights, add saturation, change the contrast, to change the brightness, and so on. To even make it tinted, change the way the sun blooms. But to do it in-game, so you, you can actually change it real-time, change it whilst you play. Now, the next mod covered in the video was a beautiful white run. And this was a mod that essentially changed white run and made it a little busier and a little bit more beautiful. Um, it added trees, it added things hanging from roofs, um, it had added small items like brooms, etc. And just made the town look a little bit more lived in. Um, and feel a little bit more complete. Uh, White Run was supposed to be the sort of commercial centre of Skyrim and it always felt a little bare. But with this mod, it just felt, you know, a little better. Not as busy as the capital city Solitude, but for the, for the sort of centre of Skyrim, it was, it was a big improvement. And it's still in use today, still a great mod. This video also covered Winter is Coming Cloaks. Um, obviously a cloak mod. Similar to the cloaks of Skyrim covered in part 19, except these cloaks were these great big bearskin type cloaks. They look very similar to the sort of cloaks you saw in the hit TV series Game of Thrones, hence the title Winter is Coming. Uh, they really do fit Skyrim very well indeed um, and the mod has been updated many times and you can find these cloaks dotted around Skyrim on guards, bandits, etc. You can craft them yourselves. There are a lot of different varieties from cheap ones to fairly um, expensive ones, ones that uh, have different types of fur trim. And you really can get a wide variety of different looks. Great mod. And lastly I covered Lockpick Graduation by Liliu. 
and this is essentially a small texture replacement for the lock picks. So when you're picking a lock, instead of the vanilla lock, you get uh, a very high quality one with little marks on it, which make it a little bit easier to remember where you were when your lock pick broke. It's not a cheat exactly, but it does make lock picking a tiny bit easier without breaking the immersion, immersion too much. And so we move on to part 21. Now, this was a video devoted to archery, and it, in a way, <laughs> attracted more than its fair share of controversy as well, uh, only mostly directed at me, because apparently I don't know anything about archery, depending on who was commenting. Um, however, that is pretty much true. We didn't get a lot of need for bows uh, where I was growing up, so there you go. However, um, the mods I covered in that video. Well, the first two were actually animation uh, mods, the one for the running animation and one for the casual animation. Um, I really am not a fan of how people carrying bows run in Skyrim. They do look a little ape-like. So that mod, still very good. Um, great way of getting rid of that horrible running. The casual bow animation is pretty cool as well. The next mod was the mod that got me into trouble, uh, proper length arrows. Now, when I was playing and using archery, uh, some of the arrows, like the dwarven arrows, seemed to sit on my hand. And I don't mean close to my hand, I mean on top of my hand, literally on the fleshy part of my hand. So when I let the arrow loose, the arrowhead would slice across my hand. Um, so I used a mod called proper length arrows, and Apparently the, this is not true. It is not proper length arrows. Arrows should be almost touching your hand, at least the base of the head. Um, however, as I said, for me, I had some arrows that were actually not touching, just touching my hand. They were lying on top of it. So I still feel that when the arrow is released, it's going to slice my fingers off. Um, but um, I'm guessing it's probably dependent on which arrows you use. I'm also wondering if it depends on... Um, different things on your system, like field of view, but I doubt it. Uh, however, I have been told many times that arrows are supposed to be very close and the proper length arrows are too far away. Uh, so it's up to you if you wish to use this mod or not. I'm wondering if it, if, it was, uh, if it was a better idea if they changed each individual arrow a different amount so that the head was just touching the, the hand rather than lying on top of it. However, not an expert. And I apologize, I apologize to all of the archers out there who got horribly offended, uh, except those of you who threw abuse at me. Uh, seriously, relax, it's a game. I also covered a mod called Closer Quivers that also had longer arrows in it as well. Uh, but the Closer Quivers part essentially made quivers touch your back. In the vanilla game, there was always a gap between them. It looked a little bothersome. So this actually placed it close to your back in actual fact probably clipping into your back ever so slightly but it was hard to notice. I also covered a mod called Arrows and Bolts Tweaked and fortunately for me the archers out there seem to think that this mod was fairly good. Um, it changed things like the damage but it also increased the speed of arrows and the consensus did seem to be that yes arrows do fly faster than in the vanilla game so thankfully I got this one right. So that is still a great mod to try if you're using a lot of archery. I also mentioned Arrowsmith reupload uh, as I had from a previous video, uh, just because it was appropriate for this. Obviously, since Dawnguard, if you have the Dawnguard DLC, not really essential. And the last mod I covered was Realistic Ragdolls and Force. Um, now, this one actually got a bit of controversy as well. What it does is it reduces the amount of knockback you get hitting things with spells and arrows. And some people were sort of saying, no, 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 arrows do knock things back. And that is true. An arrow obviously has mass, and when it hits a body, it will transfer some of its uh, momentum to that body, and that body will tend to move in the direction the arrow was traveling originally. However, I don't care if I'm not an expert on archery, my physics and my mechanics knowledge is pretty good, and I can tell you right now, you are not going to pick up a bow, shoot somebody, and have it pick them up and throw them 15 meters into the air. It's just not going to happen. I can understand if you want your spells to blow people a mile and a half backwards, because that's kind of cool. You hit them with a lightning bolt and they go flying. That's magic. 
But for me, when shooting an arrow, you know, it's not going to go flying 15 meters, unless it's a bunny rabbit. If you hit a bunny rabbit with an arrow, yeah, that's probably gonna knock it back quite some way. And I know I'm gonna get some argument on this. I just know there's gonna be some comments down below arguing with me. Part 22 was a video about a great player home. Uh, the player home was the Asteria, or Asteria. Not totally sure about the pronunciation. And this player home was a giant dwarven ship floating in the air. Floating in the air, tethered to the ground with a giant chain. And it's, it was a very unique idea at the time. Very well done. Um, the, the player home was very functional, actually. It, it had everything you needed to make a great player home. It was extremely unique, obviously, a, sh a giant flying ship. It was, it was beautiful. It was intricate. And obviously, that some, something had been put together uh, as a sort of labor of love. And I really liked the mod. But one other thing that was a little different in this video was it was the first Skyrim video I did where I didn't record everything in advance and then do voice over afterwards, I actually recorded myself traveling to this home and discovering it for the first time ever. Um, and I'd done this once before in a Fallout New Vegas player home mod, and it went down pretty well. And it was probably this video that actually prompted me to start making videos that were less tutorials and less about reviews and more entertainment. Uh, it was probably here, in fact, I, I know it was here, and the response I got to this video where I decided I would actually try a Let's Play video and see if people appreciated it. So there you go, part 22, the genesis of Steve's adventures. Now, part 23, I almost continued the Dwarven feel, the Dwemer uh, theme, and the first mod that I covered was Dwarven Mechanical Equipment. And it essentially was a mod that added blades to your arms that would sort of pop out when you needed them and when you sheathed them, they would sort of retract into the armor. Very similar to Assassin's Creed, the little sort of punch dagger there. Um, the only real difference was instead of it being on the inside of the arm, it was on the outside of the arm. Very cool looking, uh, quite functional actually, and sort of, you know, at the time, fairly unique. Um, the video was also the first time I covered a quest mod, and the mod in question was Moon Path to Elsewhere. And this was obviously inspired by the Khajiit, and it took you sort of out of Skyrim into a whole new set of areas with quest givers, um, some, some fairly cool quests, creatures to kill, etc. This was a very well done mod, and quite early released really in, the, um, in sort of the creation kit's uh, lifespan. And it's been updated several times since, and it looks like it's still well worth playing. This is one of those mods that I will probably install for my next Let's Play. I would like to see how it's changed, but from the looks of things, it's just got better and better. So, again, this is one of those mods I would really recommend. I also covered a mod called Doverkeen Relaxes 2, and this was essentially a mod that allowed your player to relax in various different manners, reading a book, sitting at a fire, even sweeping the floor, that type of thing. Obviously, this is only for hardcore role players or people who want to take screenshots or maybe do video cuts. It's all about immersion. Now, a lot of people would just take one look at this and say, why would I want to sweep the floor in a game? And that's fair enough. If it's not for you, it's not for you. Uh, plenty of mods are not for everyone, but it's actually a very popular mod. Um, it's got over 2,000 endorsements, so obviously quite a lot of people like to get immersed in the game. And lastly, I also covered Water, which as I previously mentioned um, in part two, is the replacement for the Enhanced Water Textures mod. Um, absolutely superb mod, I still use this one, definitely still used today. And the last part I'm going to talk about in this video is the Skyrim Mod Sanctuary 24. Now, this was a video devoted to finding some armor for my Let's Play. I was looking for heavy armor that was suitable for a magic-based character. Now, I covered Omega Red's armor compilation, which contains a lot of different armors, all of them 
really, really great pieces of work um, and still very much in use today. Um, I also covered robed steel plate armor, which was sort of plate armor that had that magician robe look to it. Well, basically it was steel plate armor with a magician's robe over it, but it really worked very, very well. I also covered the vagabond armor, which was light armor, so not exactly what I was thinking, but the look and feel was so good uh, that I just had to mention it. And I covered the war chief armor and the Einhard Yard armor. Now these were the two pieces of armor I really most enjoyed. Uh, they, they captured the feeling that I was going for, this sort of uh, tribal feeling, the very dangerous warlike feeling and still suitable for a shamanic type character. So these ended up being the two pieces of armor I really sort of settled on as, as being for me. But all of the armor covered in that video was well worth taking a look at. Um, one of the other mods I covered was the Dragon Priest armor. And this was a very interesting set of armor that used um, basically pieces from the Dragon Priests. And it looked great, but unfortunately it wasn't very well finished. It didn't have very good statistics at all. Um, even though it looked like heavy armor, it seemed to only be cloth. Now, I could have modded it myself, um, and I still might one day. I might actually make a patch for myself to make that heavy armor. But it's, it just looked so great that I covered it in the video anyway. And that's it for part three. And as you saw, the modding community in this period was really beginning to build up momentum. But there were a lot of mods that I'd never even thought to try because I'd never tried the right type of character. And in part four, you're gonna find me trying those out because I had just started my new Let's Play and it was a type of character that was completely new to me. And therefore, I needed a whole new set of mods. Anyway, I hope you guys join me for that.